good evening and namaskar to everybody honorable chief justice prasanna kumar varle honorable judges of the karnataka high court justice sunil dat yadav and justice sukre kamal shri raganand senior advocate shri harish narsappa senior advocate and co-founder daksh and one of the editors of the book ms aparna chandra associate professor national law school bangalore other editors of the book learned contributors to the book who are in great number today other senior members of the bar and all members of daksh and oak bridge publishers distinguished invitees ladies and gentlemen and friends <clears throat> i was to come a little later to bangalore but the function today has really attracted me to advance my uh, coming to bangalore from delhi and i thank daksh for that i think it's it's a privilege to release this book today which has been published by daksh india and oak bridge publications my congratulations and kudos and compliments for all the rigorous empirical research that has been done and gone into this book which goes into the functioning of the higher judiciary in india aptly the forward is by honorable justice madan b lokur the volume titled constitutional ideals development and realization through court led justice breaks new ground the essays touch upon the role of the supreme court as the sentinel of the quiver way in advancing and evolving the constitutional ideals in telia of dignity equality free speech and democracy i must say that the supreme court has played a crucial and a facilitator role in this discourse of social ills and systemic malaise as citizens of a constitutional democracy we must all recognize that our constitution is not just a legal document a historical event which took place when it was enforced on 26th of january 1950 it is a living tree according to me and the life into the constitution has been infused not just by the courts by governance by the executive by the parliament but by we the people of india the indian constitution is a product of anti colonial and progressive mass movement with has bold aspirations it bears as its core the anti colonial founding ethos which are impressed in the preambular principles the fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy i would say that the trans constitution of india is indeed transformative of the indian society and one of the most enduring constitutions till date we have seen democracies breaking out of the colonial rule setting up their own constitutions and governance but how many such constitutions have really endured therefore i must compliment not only those who are in governance the courts in the adjudication process but the people of india who have made it an enduring one the volume which has been just released today has a rich interdisciplinary approach in the essays and is an ode to the fact that the constitution cannot be read in abstraction from the political social and economic context i just went through the book of course the pdf copy was also sent to me and i find that the essays are of individual rights group identities systemic conundrums and institutional responses which are written about in so far as our republic is concerned i congratulate 
the editors of the book ms shruti vidyasagar ms sandhya pr and ms anandita patnaik shri harish nasappa and all the contributors who have lent their thoughts in bringing about this book and in curating the same i congratulate daksh and oak bridge publishers for publishing this book and for inviting me to release it now the book is called constitutional ideals according to judge learned hand ideals are ultimate they admit of no reduction below themselves so to our certain irreducible constitutional ideals which underpin the survival and success of constitutional order and concordial society ideals of a constitution are an expression of the overarching objects of a constitution and are so fundamental that they precede the very framing of a constitution of a country the real value of a constitution would therefore depend on the extent to which it is successful in achieving the ideals there is something in a constitution that is even more primordial than the structure and the features to this enlightened audience i need not go into the nitty gritty of the various chapters or the various structures of the constitution of india but the ideals are what were thought of by the founding fathers in their wisdom and sagacity which is inbuilt into the constitution itself i may tell this audience that with each passing with each passing decade we will realize the wisdom of our constituent assembly members and what great forethought they had in 1940s to bring about such a constitution containing the ideals but let us not just have a constitution containing ideals the whole object is to implement them to see that they are put into practice and they endure the challenge is when the endurance is challenged and that is where we the people of india must rise to have this knowledge of the constitutional ideals because they can never be reduced they can only increase the standards of what is written in the constitution either through court process or through enactments or through other ideas being exchanged in society but we can never bring anything below what is embedded and entrenched in the various chapters now what are these ideals where do we find these ideals how can the judiciary act as an enabler in the development and realization of these ideals because the focus of this book is on the judiciary being an enabler the quest to answer these ideas these questions must begin with the study of the preamble perhaps i think one of the most poetic part of any constitution the preamble has reckoned is reckoned as a transformative instrument for forwarding the ideals cherished therein and the philosophy endorsed by the constitution it embodies india and indian polity as a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic and the kinds of ideals to be secured to its citizenry namely justice liberty equality and fraternity therefore according to me there are two pronged or two dimensional classification of ideals in the constitution one those that are reflective of the nature of nations polity the inter institutional balance the framework of distribution of powers between the different organs of the state as envisaged and the second is the relationship between the citizen and the state we as constitutional law students must go on reading the preamble according to me with each pa passing year with the passage of every decade the preamble throws light to a greater and greater extent 
what the preamble meant to the court, Supreme Court in 1950, is different from what it meant to the court as well as to the people in 1970 or 80 and in this century. That is why I say that the, the preamble, which is the, really the heart of the entire constitution, must be read and reread over the years to get the real meaning. That is why I would commend every one of us who is interested in being an enlightened citizen of India to have an understanding of the preamble of the constitution. No doubt the constitution lays down the basic structure of the country's political system, such as federalism, republicanism, parliamentary democracy, tripartite system of governance, and the ideals which surround them, namely institutional checks and balances, independence and integrity of institutions. But the other side where the citizen-centric ideals are concerned, of course, all of us know the fundamental rights, the fundamental duties and directive principles of state policy are the ideals for a welfare state such as India is. It is therefore essential to understand these ideals and that is what the attempt and the endeavor of the book has been. I would say that the first gift of the constitution to we the people of India is to have the institutional foundation for the functioning of a democracy and we continue to remain a democracy. A parliamentary democracy functions according to certain postulates. The most important being the responsibility of the executive to the legislature and through the legislature to the electorate of the country. Another important postulate which has been in practice is the peaceful transfer of power or governmental authority from one party to another either as a result of adverse vote in parliament or after a general election. It presupposes a multi-party system founded on the concept of collective responsibility, which in turn is based on deliberation, criticism and exposition. But in my view, we as a nation can assert that we are delivering the ideal of democracy only when a Elections demonstrate how robust democracy is. B. Parliamentary proceedings show the vibrancy of political debate. C. In the public sphere, from the social media to everyday tea shop conversations, shows enlightened awareness and engaged citizenry. D. There exists a strong opposition. E. Institutions remain autonomous. F. Free speech remains sacrosanct, subject to reasonable restrictions. And finally, G. When the government functions within the bounds of law. If these have to be remain, it is we, the people of India, in whatever calling, position or status we may be, must endure that the authorities or organs of governance remain within their bounds and democracy ultimately thrives. The judiciary in India has played a critical role in strengthening the idea of democracy. To this enlightened audience, I need not go into the case law because it is already written in the book and known to you all. But in Keshwanand Bharti, the Supreme Court said that parliamentary democracy is a basic structure, part of the basic structure. In Indra Nehru Gandhi versus Raj Narayan, it was observed that the rule of law and free and fair elections are basic features of democracy. In Kihoto Holohon, which is with regard to the 10th schedule of the constitution, which is now very much a matter of debate, 
the Supreme Court recognized the complexity of political practice in contemporary democracies and took the view that the ideal of democracy could be secured through a variety of institutional mechanisms. Another ideal of the Constitution is federalism, which is a gift, I must say, to a large country such as India. We all know that we were about 600 and odd states, provinces, princely kingdoms, or whatever you may say. Scholars call the Indian constitution as quasi-federal or a union of states. But according to me, the idea which lies as the basis of federalism is that each of the states should have equal political rights and thereby be able to maintain their independent characteristics within the larger union. Whether a state is a small state or a large state, industrialized or not, having more of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes or less of such population, each state is in that way a state to be considered on an equal footing with every other state. The central government or the union government must play the role of a parent's patria and ensure that there is no discrimination between the states themselves. The role of the Supreme Court in adjudicating disputes which have a bearing on the powers of the federal government as well as the states was recognized in State of Rajasthan versus Union of India, where the satisfaction of the president to include issue a proclamation under Article 356 when being malefied or based on irrelevant considerations or on extraneous considerations could be examined by the court. This decision highlights that the failure of the central government to function as a parent's patria of the states within the Union of India would enable the court to ensure that the constitutional obligation is enforced between the government of India and the states and in order to secure the constitutional ideal of federalism. The next ideal, I would say, is of inter-institutional balance. Although we all have known about the separation of powers, which started from the Montesquieu's theory of separation of powers, the, which actually postulates that each institution has some power to regulate, but it actually postulates that each institution has some power to regulate the functions of the others. This is in the form of an ancillary principle of checks and balances. To this audience, I need not highlight about judicial review and the doctrine of abrogation, etc. But each organ of the state must acknowledge and respect the autonomy and independence of the other co-equal branches. Neither the judiciary nor the parliament or the executive is supreme. What is supreme is the constitution of India, which we, the people of India, have given to ourselves. Elected governments and political executives must recognize and respect the constitutionally accorded role of the judiciary in a democracy based on rule of law. Similarly, the judiciary must continue to remain conscious of the Lakshman Rekha, which is the constitutional Lakshman Rekha, so to say, of inter-institutional balance which requires that legislative wisdom or the exercise of executive discretion not be interfered with without there being any basis for the same. Just as no executive or government can question a court as to why it decided in a particular way, I feel similarly the court cannot question the parliament as to why it made the particular law. It's ultimately left to the wisdom of the authorities concerned. The only thing is whether the law is in accordance with the constitution and the other tenets of, or what we call rule of law. Similarly, a judgment 
can be criticized only if it is not in accordance with law and not as to why a particular view has been taken. That is what I say are the checks and balances underpinning the constitution. From this ideal of inter se balance between the organs flows another important ideal and that is of independence of institution. A nation can only be as independent as its institutions are. The judiciary, the central bank, the election commission, public service commissions must all be independent and autonomous and act within the bounds of law. Institutional independence has an inverse relationship with external influences over the authorities. The lesser the influence, the higher will be the scope for functional autonomy. In this context, I would like to highlight that the independence of the judiciary is one of the most cherished ideals of the Constitution. We, the judges in the courts, value this the most. It is the freedom that is given to us under the law, under the Constitution, to decide in accordance with law. Judicial independence demands that judges need to be impartial and insulated from political pressures and to be so within a broadly defined institutional scope of authority from the judicial, from the judicial branch. In my personal view, ultimately it is the personality of the judge which matters. Howsoever we may say that the judiciary is as an institution is independent, I would go a step further to say that it is the personality of the judge which finds its imprint in the judgment that he or she delivers. These are some of the ideals with regard to the various organs of the constitution and the nation's polity, is as so far as nation's polity is concerned. So with your permission, I think I'll continue a bit. The next aspect is on the ideals of relating to citizen-centric ideals, that is relationship between the state and the citizens. I would say that the first of this is the ideal of justice, which is enshrined in the preamble. What is justice? It is ultimately harmonization of interests between an individual and individual, an individual and a group, and between a group and another group. The ideal of socio-economic justice was central to the founding fathers. This is ventilated in articles 14, 15 and 16. Further, article 38 and 39 tries to secure or endeavors the ideal of economic justice. And there are various aspects of justice as an ideal under the constitution, such as socio-economic justice, which requires another day to debate upon, and therefore I will leave that topic at that. But another ideal which is of great importance to us today is liberty. The lofty preambular ideals have been precisely defined on, in chapter three of the constitution. The Supreme Court initially uh, did not really move on with the spirit of chapter three, I think. They were more cautious, circumspect, and the judicial balance was not really tilted completely in favor of the spirit behind chapter three. But in the subsequent decades, the Supreme Court and the courts in India have interpreted chapter three in such a way that it has been expanded, particularly article 14 and article 21 to include rights of the highest amplitude, such as the right to bodily integrity, right to die with dignity, right to reproductive choice, 
right of self identification of gender right to privacy i think we should look at chapter 3 as a open cauldron where various rights could be inserted or thrown into it it is not already saturated it is not already full there is a lot of space within the cauldron for the courts to ensure that many more rights are recognized and for that we require not only an enlightened citizenry but an enlightened bar to assist the courts to really recognize the these rights i may give two examples in people's union for civil liberties versus union of india the court recognized that right to food is a part of article 21 of the constitution and that was in 1997 which later on prodded the parliament to come out with the national food security act 2013 similarly the right to right of the public to government information was a campaign which started in the late 70s which ultimately culminated in the right to information act 2005 the courts have therefore been at the forefront and led by the supreme court in securing the constitutional ideals of liberty and it is for the people of india we the people of india to ensure that liberty remains with us justice liberty equality and fraternity are the ideals enumerated in the preamble but i find that justice liberty equality has not been of the same level as fraternity or to put it in other words fraternity has not reached the level as justice liberty equality fraternity even today remains the least understood least discussed and perhaps the least practiced of the four ideals spelt out in the constitution fraternity which signifies the dignity of the individual and unity of the nation must be emphasized in today's world dignity of the individual is accomplished by recognizing the moral equality of individuals upheld through mutual respect despite all our differences of religious belief caste language culture ethnicity class and gender it is the constitution which according to me binds us and hence it is that very book which has made us to remain as one nation and will continue to do so for times to come the idea of the unity of the nation being derived from fraternity is even more significant fraternity according to me will help in deepening democratic values in our society but i must add one thing here that the ideal of fraternity has to some extent found its elaboration in article 51a of the constitution in the form of fundamental duties i need not narrate what are the various fundamental duties but i must say that in today's world the essence of fundamental duties is to achieve an ideal citizenship when i speak of a citizen of india it is not just a relationship between the citizen and the state and the duties of a citizen towards the state it also encompasses the duties of one citizen towards another now whether they are vertical rights and horizontal rights i'd not like to discuss today because that itself is another uh, longish debate but when we look at these aspects holistically we must realize that to become ideal citizens we need to cherish and practice the values of the indian constitution and also preserve and hand over those values as also the values of the indian society the few to the future generation 
Now, when we talk of values of citizenship, in my view, the value of integrity is of the highest. But alas, with the passing of every year, integrity is losing its value in our total value system. Bribery, corruption and flaunting of ill-gotten wealth has become the order of the day and has been entrenched in Indian society. Disproportionate assets possessed by certain persons, especially in those in public life, are hardly thought of as black marks in our society. In today's scenario, the word affordability is losing its meaning. There were times when people used to think times, several times, if not twice, before spending on luxuries or on material comforts. While the country has grown economically, which is a very good sign, and there have been greater generation of incomes amongst the people, what is of great worry is disproportionate assets. That is income from other than known sources, which is a worrying factor. We may progress as a nation, economically, socially, claim ourselves to be world citizens, have a great constitution, but if we lack integrity, what is it at the end? I wonder as to why there is no protest from members of the family of public servants who are indulging in bribery and corruption. If we have to be ideal citizens, then the time has now come to take a pledge against graft and also to practice integrity as a way of life. I would appeal to everyone to shun benefits obtained from ill-gotten money if there is a determination made by everybody to refuse to benefit from graft, the need for such filthy lucre would automatically reduce, if not disappear. But for that, there is a need to determine to live within the known sources of income, whatever may be the attractions, consumerism and materialism. We have to shun materialism and consumerism and devote greater attention towards being ideal citizens of the country. Then only we could maintain and ensure that our constitution remains and gives us strength as a nation. Next, I would proceed to another ideal, which is secularism. Unlike in the West, in India, secularism was never born out of a conflict between the state and the church. It was perhaps rooted in India's own past history and culture and was very much a response to her pluralism. Secularism in the sense that it is meant under the Indian constitution is that the state does not owe loyalty to one any one religion. The state equally respects all religions. The vision of the founding fathers was that a nation transcending all diversities of religion, caste and creed to bring about a new social order based on justice, social, economic and political. The constitution has sought to establish a secular order under which the religious majority of the population did not enjoy any preferential treatment at the hands of the state and the religious rights of the minorities were protected in different ways even under the constitution. Indra Sauni versus Union of India and SR Bombay versus Union of India are two decisions where the concept of secularism has been discussed. First, the separation of the temporal from the religious and second, the spirit of neutrality and tolerance. Before I end, I would like to refer to Bijo Emanuel was the state of Kerala, which has, through the words of Justice Chinnap Reddy, said, our tradition teaches tolerance, our philosophy preaches tolerance, our constitution practices tolerance. Let us not dilute it. Unquote. It is in that context that I highlight 
the constitutional duty of tolerance without which democracy would be placed under a siege. To achieve the noble ideal of secularism entrenched in the constitution, tolerance is a key virtue. I may also quote, but I would not do so, but only refer to Navte Johar versus Union of India, wherein Justice Dr. Dhananjay Chandrachut, as his lordship then was, and the present Chief Justice, has referred to constitutional morality and the duty of all the citizens. The tenets which I have now discussed are the basic ideals of the constitution. The authors of the book may have identified many more, but I haven't had the time to go through it in such a detail. I suppose in the discussion it will come out. An introspection as to whether these ideals have been secured in the Indian context would also provide a template for conversation about building a better tomorrow. We as a nation have come a long way, but we have a longer way to go before truly meeting all the ideals of the founders in the sense that they were envisaged. Fortunately, there is a framework towards achieving these ideals, a framework provided by the constitution itself. A more democratic, a more equal, a more just and a more tolerant nation continues to remain an ideal, even in contemporary times. Before I conclude, I once again congratulate everyone who is involved in conceptualizing, writing, editing, and publishing this worthy book. The chapters of this book are testimony to the wide tapestry of lives and laws that our constitution touches, moves, and inspires like a North Star. North Star. With this, I end thanking each one of you for your kind attention. Namaskar.